But, in the event that, notwithstanding this warning of mine, you should nevertheless wish to become acquainted with the further contents of my expositions, then there is already nothing else left for me to do but to wish you with all my genuine soul a very, very good appetite, and that you may digest all that you read, not only for your own health, but for the health of all those near you. I said, with my genuine soul, because recently living in Europe and coming in frequent contact with people who on every appropriate and inappropriate occasion are fond of taking in vain every sacred name which should belong only to man's inner life. That is to say, with people who swear to no purpose, I being, as I have already confessed, a follower in general not only of the theoretical, as contemporary people have become, but also of the practical sayings of popular wisdom which have become fixed by centuries, and therefore of the saying which in the present case corresponds to what is expressed by the words, when you are in Rome, do as Rome does. Decided, in order not to be out of harmony with the custom established here in Europe of swearing in ordinary conversation, and at the same time to act according to the commandment which was enunciated by the holy lips of St. Moses, not to take the holy names in vain, to make use of one of those examples of the newly baked fashionable languages of the present time, namely English, and so from then on I began on necessary occasions to swear by my English soul. The point is that in this fashionable language the word soul and the bottom of your foot, also called soul, are pronounced and even written almost alike. I do not know how it is with you, who are already partly candidate for a buyer of my writings, but my peculiar nature cannot, even with a great mental desire, avoid being indignant at the fact, manifested by people of contemporary civilization, that the very highest in man, particularly beloved by our common father creator, can really be named, and indeed very often before even having made clear to oneself what it is, can be understood to be that which is lowest and dirtiest in man. Well, enough philologizing. Let us return to the main task of this initial chapter, destined, among other things, on the one hand to stir up the drowsy thoughts in me, as well as in the reader, and on the other hand to warn the reader about something and so, I have already composed in my head the plan and sequence of the intended expositions, but what form they will take on paper, I, speaking frankly, myself, do not as yet know with my consciousness. But with my subconsciousness, I already definitely feel that, on the whole, it will take the form of something which will be, so to say, hot, and will have an effect on the entirety of every reader such as the red pepper pods had on the poor transcaucasian curd. Now that you've become familiar with the story of our common countryman, the transcaucasian curd, I already consider it my duty to make a confession. And hence, before continuing this first chapter, which is by way of an introduction to all my further predetermined writings, I wish to bring to the knowledge of what is called your pure waking consciousness the fact that in the writings following this chapter of warning I shall expound my thoughts intentionally in such sequence and with such logical confrontation that the essence of certain real notions may of themselves automatically, so to say, go from the waking consciousness which most people, in their ignorance, mistake for the real consciousness, but which I affirm and experimentally prove is the fictitious one, into what you call the subconscious, which ought to be, in my opinion, the real human consciousness, 
and thereby themselves mechanically bring about that transformation which should in general proceed in the entirety of a man and give him from his own conscious mentation the results he ought to have which are proper to man and not merely to single or double-brained animals. I decided to do this without fail so that this initial chapter of mine predetermined, as I have already said, to awaken your consciousness should fully justify its purpose and reaching not only your, in my opinion, as yet only fictitious consciousness but also your real consciousness, that is to say what you call your subconscious might for the first time compel you to reflect actively. In the entirety of every man, irrespective of his heredity and education, there are formed two independent consciousnesses, which in their functioning, as well as in their manifestations, have almost nothing in common. One consciousness is formed from the perception of all kinds of accidental or on the part of others intentionally produced mechanical impressions, among which must also be counted the consonances of various words which are indeed, as is said, empty. And the other consciousness is formed from the, so to say, already previously formed material results transmitted to him by heredity which have become blended with the corresponding parts of the entirety of a man, as well as from the data arising from his intentional evoking of the associative confrontations of these materialized data already in him. The whole totality of the formation, as well as the manifestation of this second human consciousness, which is none other than what is called the subconscious and which is formed from the materialized results of heredity and the confrontations actualized by one's own intentions should, in my opinion, formed by many years of experimental elucidations during exceptionally favorable arranged conditions, predominate in the common presence of man. As a result of this conviction of mine, which as yet doubtlessly seems to you the fruit of the fantasies of an afflicted mind, I cannot now, as you yourself see, disregard this second consciousness, and, compelled by my essence, am obliged to construct the general exposition, even of this first chapter of my writings, namely the chapter which should be the preface for everything further, calculating that it should reach, and in the manner required for my aim, ruffle the perceptions accumulated in both these consciousnesses of yours. Continuing my expositions with this calculation, I must first of all inform your fictitious consciousness that thanks to three definite peculiar data which were crystallized in my entirety during various periods of my preparatory age, I am really unique in respect of the, so to say, muddling and befuddling of all the notions and convictions supposedly firmly fixed in the entirety of people with whom I come in contact. Tut, tut, tut. I already feel that in your false, but according to you, real consciousness, there are beginning to be agitated like blinded flies all the chief data transmitted to you by heredity from your uncle and mother, the totality of which data always and in everything at least engenders in you the impulse, nevertheless extremely good, of curiosity, as in the given sense to find out as quickly as possible why I, that is to say, a novice at writing, whose name has not even once been mentioned in the newspapers, have suddenly become so unique. Never mind. I personally am very pleased with the arising of this curiosity, even though only in your false consciousness. As I already know from experience that this impulse, unworthy of man, can sometimes even pass from this consciousness into one's nature and become a 